Okay, in the interest of time, I think we'll get started. We have, oh, sorry about that, a jam-packed um, event today for you, and I'm thrilled to be able to welcome Dr. John Semple, who is a plastic surgeon at Women's College. Some of you may have met him. He's been working alongside our group for many, many years now, and many of our patients are fortunate enough to have a chance to meet with Dr. Semple and discuss the option of surgical prevention of breast cancer. So today we're dividing it up. And for those of you who don't know me, even though um, many of you may have been in our seminar previously, I am Kelly Metcalf. I'm a scientist in the breast cancer group. And um, we're bringing this to you today. So how we've decided to, uh, to bring this talk to you today is I am going to present to you some of the latest research in this area. And it really is late breaking research. We've just analyzed some of this data in the last couple of weeks. It is not yet published. So you will be uh, some of the first people to see some of this data. And I'm thrilled to be able to share it with you because many of you may have contributed data to this study from the risk factor study. So I will present that. And then Dr. Semple is actually gonna take us through more information about the surgeries, the type of things that uh, a woman would be considering if she's making the choice whether or not to have a risk-reducing mastectomy. So we do talk a little bit about the language is changing over time. We used to call it a prophylactic mastectomy or preventive mastectomy. Now we're seeing more about risk reduction surgery. So we will use those interchangeably today. So, but just uh, realize that they mean the same thing. Okay, so we'll get started on some of the uh, information for you today. And just a reminder, there is a Q&A button in the very bottom. So if you would please type your question in as we go along. And at the end, Dr. Katsopoulos isn't with us today, but I will bring those questions uh, to both Dr. Semple and I, and we will answer as many as possible. So just to remind everyone, prophylactic or risk-reducing mastectomy can be done either with in a woman without a previous diagnosis of breast cancer. So that's called the bilateral prophylactic mastectomy where both breasts are removed prior to a woman being diagnosed with breast cancer. Or she could have had a previous diagnosis of cancer in one breast. And then we're now considering removing the contralateral or the, the other side, the breast to, re to reduce the risk of cancer developing in that breast as well. So let's first talk about surgical prevention of contralateral breast cancer. So this is for women who have been diagnosed with breast cancer in the past. So the things that we need to be thinking about for these women are, what is the risk that they're going to go on and develop a new breast cancer in the opposite breast or contralateral breast cancer? And if they uh, do develop a contralateral breast cancer, how is that going to have an impact on their chance of survival? And how can we use surgical treatment to think about increasing the chance that a woman will survive her breast cancer? So this is data that I've presented before. This isn't uh, our latest data, but this is paper, uh, paper that we published quite a while ago now looking at the uh, risk of a contralateral breast cancer in women with a BRCA1 or BRCA2 mutation. And you can see here that at 15 years from the time of diagnosis, a woman has about a 34% risk of developing a new breast cancer in the opposite breast. So this is about 2% per year if we're thinking about it on an annual basis. And considering that many of these women are diagnosed at a young age in their 40s and their 50s, we expect these women that if they survive that initial breast cancer, they have a very long lifespan ahead of them. So thinking about this high risk of developing a new breast cancer, we need to be thinking about that in addition to treating that first breast cancer. So this is just another way of looking at the data when we're looking at the, the age of diagnosis, and hopefully you can see my mouse, but the, the top bar here is women who are diagnosed with breast cancer, I'm sorry, oops, at a very, 
uh, at a younger age. So this is under the age of 40. You can see that these women have the highest risk at 15 years of developing a contralateral breast cancer. And you can see that it's over a 40% risk. The, the older a woman gets, so this is women 40 to 49, again, lower risk, but still we're looking at a high risk over 30% at 15 years. Women over the age of 50 have the lowest risk of developing a contralateral breast cancer. However, it's still high, about 1% per year. So 15% at 15 years. So again, things that we need to be thinking about when a woman is making a decision about a contralateral prophylactic mastectomy. You can see here, this is just another way of looking at the data when we're looking at age of diagnosis. And I know these numbers are not always easy to understand, but I will interpret them for you. You can see that if a woman is diagnosed with breast cancer over the age of 50, she is about half the risk of developing a contralateral breast cancer compared to a young woman. So a woman under the age of 40 at diagnosis. We also know that a woman who has an oophorectomy both for the prevention of their ovarian cancer, because remember these women have a BRCA1 or BRCA2 mutation, but an oophorectomy also reduces a woman's risk of developing a contralateral breast cancer by about 52%. So you can see that uh, relative risk of 0.48, that translates into a 52% reduction in risk of a contralateral, uh, contralateral breast cancer associated with oophorectomy. So again, many different decisions to be made for these women. This is a more recent paper that came out of the UK, and it's based on international data. It was a very large study where uh, centers contributed from all over the world. And again, this is looking at the rate of contralateral breast cancer in women with a previous diagnosis of breast cancer, either by BRCA1 or BRCA2. And remember what we said about these women being diagnosed at a young age, and we expect them to have a very long lifespan after their initial diagnosis of breast cancer. So you can see if a woman with a BRCA1, if we look at her risk uh, after 20 years of a breast cancer, and we look over here, you can see she has a 53% risk of developing a contralateral breast cancer. So this is very high. This is much higher than what we'd be seeing in the general population of women without a BRCA1 or 2 mutation with breast cancer. So we need to be thinking about this. And a woman often considers having a contralateral prophylactic mastectomy. So what is the impact of that surgery on survival? This was a study that we published a number of years ago as well, comparing survival in women who had a bilateral mastectomy, so they are having a contralateral prophylactic mastectomy, compared to women who are being treated with a unilateral mastectomy, so only the breast with cancer is being removed. You can see about um, 181 women did elect to have that contralateral prophylactic mastectomy. And when you look at the bottom there, the 20 year survival rate, you can see it's very different for those women with a bilateral mastectomy compared to those with a unilateral mastectomy. 88% for women who elected to have their other breast removed preventatively or prophylactically um, is 88% is compared to women who chose to keep their other breast intact, so 66%. And how does this translate into looking at the impact on survival? And that's what we're really thinking about. So if we follow those women for 20 years, you can see she reduces her risk of dying of breast cancer by about half again, with a contralateral prophylactic mastectomy because these contralateral prophylactic mastectomies are preventing that contralateral breast cancer, which is having an impact on survival. So it's not necessarily the impact of that first breast cancer, but it's the second breast cancer, the one that we could prevent with surgery. And you can see here again, in another graph, another way of looking at it, and these are the women who had a contralateral prophylactic mastectomy. These are the women who did not. And you can see the difference in survival for these women. So again, a significant difference in survival. So this is often a conversation a woman has at the time of breast cancer diagnosis about whether or not she wishes to remove her 
opposite breast to prevent a new breast cancer from happening. And often we'll see women returning uh, to see their surgeon about this option, even after that primary surgical uh, treatment of her first breast cancer. So let's move on and talk about surgical prevention of breast cancer in women who have never had a diagnosis of breast cancer. And for many of these women, it's a very difficult decision to make, uh, electing to have both breasts removed prior to the development of breast cancer. And Dr. Semple is going to talk a little bit about that and how um, you can be supported in making a decision and what the, um, the considerations that you need to think about. I first want to present you with some of this data on looking, because I think it's important to put it into perspective about when a woman should be thinking about bilateral mastectomy. So this is a graph showing the age of onset of breast cancer in women with a BRCA mutation and women with a BRCA2 mutation. I'm sorry. My mouse is very sensitive today. So um, you can see here in the dark line, this is BRCA1 and the yellow line is BRCA2. And what we start to see is that risk of breast cancer, these are ages, at the age of 30, really starting to increase. You can see at the age of 40, there's about a 20% risk, over, over 20, 22% for BRCA1, and slightly less, maybe a 15% for BRCA2. So these are high risk. So if we're thinking about preventing breast cancers, we need to think about doing this surgery prior to when we see these cancers being diagnosed. And remembering that they're diagnosed often through screening or through a woman presenting with a lump, we need to think about going back even more years than that when we're thinking about how long it's taking for those cancers to develop and start growing that we're actually able to detect them either through screening or through a woman or her healthcare provider in a physical exam. So it's important to think about these ages when you're thinking about whether or not you want to have um, a prophylactic mastectomy. Obviously we want to do it before we would start to see the highest risks of breast cancer happening in these women. So some of the things that we think about when we're thinking about uh, prophylactic mastectomy is what is the risk of breast cancer? Often that's something, you know, a woman can't make a decision without some of these numbers. And to date, we have had some information on the incidence. So what is the risk of breast cancer after surgery? But we, what we haven't really been able to answer is what is the risk of death from breast cancer after a risk-reducing mastectomy? Because ultimately that is our goal. We don't want women to either be diagnosed or to die of breast cancer after they undergo this surgery. So this again is the data that I'm presenting this new data for you today, looking um, at some of these, these, these two questions that are very important to many women when they're making a decision. So this study, we looked at data from the risk factor study. Like I said, many of you may have participated in this. Women had a BRCA1 or 2 mutation. They had no previous diagnosis of breast cancer or ovarian cancer, and they were between the ages of 25 and 75. And what we did is an interesting type of analysis where we matched women with, with and without a risk-reducing mastectomy. And we were matching them on age, we were matching them on country, and we were matching them on genes. So BRCA1 was matched with BRCA1, BRCA2 was matched with BRCA2. And because we match them and they're at the very, they have very similar circumstances, we would have expected them to have the same risk of breast cancer if one of them hadn't had a risk reducing mastectomy. These women were not just from Canada, they were from nine different countries and we followed them from an average of 6.3 years after the risk reducing mastectomy and the mean age was 42.3 years. So here is some of the data. You can see, like I said, we had 1,660 women. Half of those had a bilateral prophylactic mastectomy. Half of those did not. Of those who did have a bilateral prophylactic mastectomy, 19 women were diagnosed with breast cancer, so 2.3%. The majority, almost 98%, were not diagnosed with breast cancer. If we look at the comparison of those without risk-reducing mastectomy, 
18.4% of these women developed breast cancer in that follow-up period. Remember, it's about six years of follow-up. Um, so this 18% can be compared to 2%. Of the women with a prophylactic mastectomy, 0.2% of these women died of breast cancer compared to 1.4% in those without a bilateral prophylactic mastectomy. So let's look at this a little bit closer because I think it's important to really understand what's going on with these cancers that were developed after a risk-reducing mastectomy. So like I said, there were a total of 19 in the, in the entire cohort of 830. And you can see 14 of these 19 were diagnosed at the time of risk-reducing mastectomy. So if a woman has a bilateral mastectomy, the breast tissue is sent to pathology and they, they look at the breast very closely to see if there's any cancer. For 14 of these women, there was a cancer found very small that was not detected on screening found um, at the time of surgery. None of those women died of breast cancer. So these were actually 14 cancers that were that could potentially have led to cancer uh, cancer related death if they were not detected at this early stage. So we consider this um, a success of risk reducing mastectomy that we can pick these cancers up very, very small. But again, remember, the numbers are small. There were five women who did develop breast cancer after risk reducing mastectomy, and these were diagnosed on average at about five years after surgery. And of those five breast cancers, two women died of breast cancer. So let's look at those cancers a little bit earlier. So I just want to remind you that those diagnosed at the time of surgery are called occult breast cancers. Those who are that are diagnosed after breast can after prophylactic mastectomy are called incident breast cancers. So we're looking at the ones that are diagnosed after surgery. You can see the majority of these women had a nipple sparing mastectomy. They were all BRCA1. And you can see the ages at the time of risk reducing mastectomy. And thinking about that in relation to that graph that I showed you earlier about when we start to see the ages increasing. Um, the women who died of uh, one woman had a total mastectomy and one woman had a nipple sparing mastectomy who died of breast cancer after the risk reducing mastectomy. But when we look at all of this data and although we'd like to see zero deaths, uh, we didn't. There were uh, two, like I said, but two in a large group of women. What risk of breast cancer, when we're looking at incidence here, so we're looking at how did this surgery do in relation to reducing the chance of a woman ever developing breast cancer, this surgery offered a 79% reduction, both in occult and incident. So if we think about the 10-year incidence in women without a risk-reducing mastectomy of developing breast cancer, she has about a 15% risk. Women with a risk-reducing mastectomy have about a 3% risk of developing a breast cancer. And you can see the difference by the type of risk-reducing mastectomy. And again, that's both occult and incident. If we look at incident only, so those that are not diagnosed at the time of surgery, these are post-surgical breast cancers, a woman has just over a 1% risk at 10 years. And for women with a total mastectomy, that's just 0.3% risk at 10 years. Um, now, if we look at mortality, we can see that risk-reducing mastectomy is associated with an 82% reduction in death. And we see both of those deaths occurring in women with a BRCA1 mutation. And remember, we start to see those breast cancers being diagnosed at an earlier age in BRCA1 as opposed to BRCA2. So the probability of dying of breast cancer within 15 years for women with a BRCA1 and BRCA2, overall, if we look at those with a risk-reducing mastectomy, is less than 1%. The probability of dying with a total mastectomy is just 0.3% at 15 years, and it's slightly higher for those with a nipple sparing mastectomy. And I, I would like to caution you as well that this um, represents many different countries, and there that's why when thinking about, and I think Dr. Semple will talk a little bit about that, it's really important to be thinking about 
where you're having your surgery done, the high volume centers, like what we have at Women's College, where we have surgeons and plastic surgeons who specialize in risk reducing mastectomy. So I'm gonna end there. And if you have questions, we I can take them at the end because I think it's really important that Dr. Semple talks a little bit more about some of the clinical issues with these different types of surgery. And then we can go back and bring it all together for you at the end and you can ask questions. So I'll pass it off to you, Dr. Semple. Thank you, Kelly, and uh, welcome everybody. Um, uh, I think do I, I think I have to ask you to change the slides, correct? Yes. Um, next slide. Yes, thank you. Uh, so the objectives of this talk, uh, if you can back up one, uh, thank you, is to review current techniques in prophylactic mastectomy or risk reduction mastectomy, and to become familiar with current clinical and technical updates in breast reconstruction. And I will uh, warn you that this is more or less just an overview of uh, this topic. And uh, any of these one uh, areas can uh, be a, a whole hour talk. And so um, uh, we won't cover a lot of the details. Uh, my objective today is to uh, cover most of the areas that you may encounter if you go for consultation uh, so that you have uh, you are familiar with uh, some of the terms. And um, we uh, certainly recognize that uh, these days, uh, surgeons uh, can be uh, rather confusing in terms of how we present things because we rarely advise you on what's correct for you. We'll just present options and uh, let you choose. And, and it is difficult to absorb enough information um, to feel like you're making an informed decision. So this is what this is all about, is to try to give you a background and help you uh, with some of your decision-making processes. Uh, Kelly, next slide. So prophylactic mastectomy, oh, the definition is, uh, and this is the same as a risk reduction uh, surgery, is to remove one or both breasts to reduce the risk of developing breast cancer. And according to the National Cancer Institute, prophylactic mastectomy in women who carry uh, BRCA1 or BRCA2 or any other gene mutation may be able to reduce, reduce the risk of developing breast cancer by 90 to 95%. Now that sort of conflicts with some of the newer data that uh, Kelly was talking about, but generally it's a very large reduction. And I wanted to add here too that uh, after a risk reduction mastectomy, all that breast tissue uh, which is removed, uh, is thoroughly inspected and analyzed by a pathologist to look for any breast disease, including occult breast cancer. Uh, next slide. So essentially there are three types of mastectomy. One is a simple or total mastectomy uh, during which uh, the nipple and areola and all of the breast tissue are removed. Uh, the axillary lymph node dissection or removal of the underarm lymph nodes is not performed and no muscles are removed. A skin sparing mastectomy is, is the same as the total mastectomy. However, the skin envelope is kept as much as possible, but the surgeon removes uh, only the nipple and the areola. And a nipple sparing mastectomy is uh, where the entire envelope of the breast is kept, uh, the nipple uh, and areola and the skin uh, are kept and uh, the, which uh, allows for a much more aesthetic um, reconstruction at the same time. Um, not all patients are uh, suitable for nipple sparing mastectomy. Uh, and we can discuss some of this as we go. Next slide. Uh, this just is a diagram showing uh, a breast uh, a, um, on, the, on the left side. You can see that there, the breast is made up of skin on the outside, uh, the nipple at the apex of the breast mound, and then there's uh, fat and then the ductal uh, tissue or the breast tissue at the center, and then the muscles and the ribs. And 
A skin sparing mastectomy, just for reference, uh, takes away all of the breast tissue except a very thin layer of fat on the underside of the skin, but also takes the nipple and the areola. So, and this allows us to do an immediate uh, form of breast reconstruction, um, which in a total mastectomy, you wouldn't be able to do. Next slide, please. And this is just uh, showing you again, a mammogram, which I believe everybody has seen a picture of, just showing you the distribution of the breast tissue and how it can go up to very close to the skin and the nipple. And so that the nipple sparing mastectomy has to be done uh, very carefully by the breast surgeon and uh, often the skin flaps can be very thin. Next slide, please. Now, when we're talking about nipple sparing mastectomies, uh, the skin incisions that we use for the risk reduction mastectomy or the prophylactic mastectomy, there's several. There's the inframammary fold or the IMF, which is done in the crease underneath the breast, the radial or the lateral incision, which is done uh, on the side of the breast in a straight line up to the nipple, a periareolar, which just means the same lateral in incision, uh, but around the nipple itself. And then there is the vertical uh, incision, which allows for access uh, to the, uh, the breast tissue underneath. Um, and the most common ones we use for smaller breasts would be um, the IMF or the one on the far left. And for a slightly larger, we would use the radial or the lateral incision. Um, and we try to stay away from the nipple as much as possible to avoid any disruption in the blood supply. And we have other options too, if there are large breasts. So uh, for instance, if you have uh, say a, a D cup or a double D cup, it becomes quite difficult to save the nipple uh, without the nipple being uh, challenged with its uh, blood supply and not surviving. And there is a, a phenomena called nipple necrosis uh, where the nipple can break down if there's no blood supply. Um, but that um, we have ways of working around that. But if your breast is too big, you may not be able to keep the nipple. Next slide, please. Uh, so again, the skin incisions, and this is a lateral incision, a pretty common one for us to use. And this is what it looks like uh, just in terms of say uh, six months to a year down the road and the breast mound is created uh, through several methods which we'll talk about uh, but this uh, goes pretty straightforward from that point of view and aesthetically it's quite good. Um, so reconstruction uh, after prophylactic mastectomy um, often choose to have breast reconstruction either at the same time as the mastectomy or at a later time. So we talk about immediate reconstruction or delayed reconstruction. And even though we talk about immediate reconstruction, it may not just be one procedure because we often go back and do uh, minor procedures or uh, fine tuning procedures uh, to just to correct certain things as well. Um, so the immediate reconstruction helps in that you go to sleep with the breast, you have the mastectomy, and at the same time, uh, you have the reconstruction done and you actually wake up with the breast at the same time. And as we mentioned before, there's often minor follow-up or touch-up procedures following the initial procedure. Yes, next slide. So the things to consider here are how important is rebuilding your breast to you? And uh, can you live uh, with a breast form or an external breast that goes in your bra uh, that you take off and put on? And will the breast reconstruction help you feel more whole or uh, will it allow you to uh, carry on your activities or sports or yoga or anything like that that you want to carry on uh, going forward? And so we only say this because we don't want to uh, hard sell the component of reconstruction. Many women live without reconstruction in a flat chest and are quite happy with that. However, if you're having reconstruction, our reconstruction goals involve ample soft tissue coverage, proper contour and shape to the breast mound, a degree of symmetry between the breasts, although 
we always uh, remind uh, patients uh, that there's never actually true symmetry. And one of my female colleagues um, mentions to her patients that they're sisters, they're not twins, uh, which is a good way of looking at it. Um, and realistic nipple areola complex with correct placement. Um, so there are forms of reconstruction that we can talk about as well. And obviously we want a high degree of patient satisfaction. Next slide. And there are two main uh, types of breast reconstruction. There is implant reconstruction where we can insert an implant uh, directly. Uh, it can be saline or uh, a combination of the two. Uh, and uh, there can be, uh, the other method is using your own tissue, uh, which is uh, autologous. We call it autologous. It could be flap reconstruction using tissue uh, taken from uh, another part of your body, such as your lower tummy, uh, the tissue it's normally thrown away after a tummy tuck. It can be taken from your back or your thigh, um, but it also uh, can include an implant as well. But generally these leave uh, don't, what we call donor sites. So there's usually a scar where a lot of that tissue is taken from. And I'm going to mention two other uh, aspects here, which we talk about as ancillary procedures. Fat grafting, you may have read about in large amounts uh, to make a whole breast. We're not quite there. Although if you look, uh, if you look under Dr. Google or on other websites, uh, there may be people out there claiming that they can reconstruct an entire breast uh, from fat grafting. Uh, it's not quite uh, perfected yet, and uh, we're, we can do small amounts, uh, which we use very commonly uh, for contouring and also filling in uh, defects of the breast. Um, but we're, there's a lot of work being done on uh, large amounts of fat grafting, uh, but making a whole breast yet for a large breast is not quite there. Um, also, we talk about ADM or acellular dermal matrix. And uh, next slide, please. Um, the uh, acellular dermal matrix is actually a very thin layer of skin, which I'll talk about shortly. But this is uh, autologous, or this is what we call uh, a Dieppe flap, where uh, tissue is taken from the lower abdomen. Again, it's tissue that we normally be thrown away after a tummy tuck. So if, um, if you have tissue down there, and this generally uh, is in uh, women who are more mature, uh, who would be quite happy to reinvest that tissue somewhere else. Uh, so this can be utilized to make an entire breast or even two breasts uh, in, this, in this regard and uh, with, with good results. Next slide. And this just shows you some pictures of uh, patients that have had uh, reconstruction using their own tissue, some with uh, nipple reconstruction and others with not. But all of these pic uh, pictures show a patient having had one side reconstructed uh, using their own tissue. You can see some of the scars in the lower abdomen uh, where that tissue has been taken from. And there are different ways of that tissue can either be taken off and rejoined using a microscope, or it can be left connected to one of the muscles uh, in the abdomen. Next slide, please. Uh, and this is uh, the other method where we use implants or a tissue expander. The tissue expander is a temporary stage uh, where we might have to uh, save the pocket by placing a, a, a spacer or a tissue expander uh, to uh, keep that space open and then it's replaced with an implant, which is on the right, um, which is a more uh, more permanent, but not completely permanent uh, form of reconstruction. Next slide, please. This is the acellular dermal matrix that we talk about, which we sometimes use, not in every case, but in some cases we will use this uh, to help uh, with the reconstruction. It's a very thin layer of skin which is donated by patients who also donate their kidneys. Uh, so when you sign your license in Canada, if you sign your license to donate your kidneys or um, your corneas and things like that, you also sign for the use of donating this skin, which is a living gift 
uh, to that patient. And it uh, comes to us sterile in a package. It looks like a, a piece of wet cardboard. There's no DNA or cells in it, and it works very well for the type of reconstruction uh, that we're, we're doing these days. Uh, next slide, please. Also fat grafting, as I mentioned before, we can take uh, very small amounts of fat uh, from different parts of the body, primarily the abdomen area. This is not liposuction per se. It's like mini liposuction. So we can take a small amount of fat and we can graft it into the uh, different areas of the breast that require contouring. And if you had an A cup, uh, a very small breast uh, in the, near future, there may be ways of reconstructing the breast uh, with uh, uh, fat. Next slide, please. Uh, this just shows you uh, some diagrams showing uh, the implant uh, underneath the muscle. And generally the types of reconstruction we can do with an implant are either under the muscle or on top of the muscle. Can we have the uh, next slide, please? Um, this is just another method of uh, where we try to preserve the muscle as much as possible. Next slide. Uh, and we talk about now uh, in patients with smaller breasts, we talk about prepectoral reconstruction where the implant is placed on top of the muscle. And in some cases, this helps uh, in younger patients that have a smaller breast uh, and uh, it avoids disruption of the muscle uh, and is maybe one of the options um, that is uh, offered to you uh, at the time. Next slide, please. Uh, this just shows you uh, three patients that have had the different types of mastectomy, but reconstruction uh, with an implant. So the uh, patient on your far left um, under the letter A, this is a skin sparing mastectomy. Uh, and the reconstruction has been done with um, uh, an implant. And the middle patient here is uh, a areola sparing. So the nipple has been taken, but the areola has been saved with a lateral uh, access incision. Um, and the patient uh, on your far right with uh, under the letter C, she's had a nipple sparing mastectomy, uh, again, with a lateral incision. And all of these patients are, have, I, I agree, a fairly uh, small breast, but they're up about large B, small C type of cup, uh, but with a good result. Next slide. Uh, just showing you a patient um, on the left. Uh, this is uh, preoperative and the patient, uh, the same patient on the right, post mastectomy. This is through an inframammary fold or in the crease underneath the breast. And it does change the shape of um, the breast and changes uh, the, uh, uh, the position of the nipple somewhat. And you might think that this uh, could possibly be a different patient, but if you check the moles, uh, the moles are, are all the same in this regard. Uh, you can see again from the side or an oblique view showing the pre and the post. The breast implants we use make the breast a fuller breast. It rounds it out. The upper pole is much more full, and um, but is still a good reconstruction. And uh, we have a high degree of patient satisfaction from the patients. Next, please. Again, uh, from the opposite side, uh, showing the change in the shape of the breast. Next. And again, um, next slide, please. Uh, just this is a different patient uh, with the uh, nipple areola. Next uh, slide, please. Uh, this is an MRI following uh, reconstruction, which shows that most of the breast is the implant. And you can see how that thin white layer around the outside of the breast well, and the nipple at the apex of that breast mound. But there is a very small amount of fat and skin left there. So really, uh, there is very little breast tissue left behind. So for what Dr. Metcalf was uh, talking about, um, there is uh, 
it's a very thorough uh, mastectomy and a very thorough risk reduction uh, when you have one of these mastectomies. Next slide, please. So the one thing we always like to uh, stress with uh, patients is that it's important to know that while the breast reconstruction rebuilds the shape of the breast, it doesn't restore sensation to the breast or the nipple. And we know that the nipple has a very large amount of uh, density of uh, nerve endings. Um, however, over time, uh, the skin over the reconstructed breast can become more sensitive and the nerves will grow back in. It may never come back to the 100%. Um, you, never, you may never have erectile tissue in the nipple again. Uh, it never comes back to that, that same form, but you get some sensation back, but it takes a very long time. The nerves grow a millimeter a day. Um, and it's one of the things that we want to make sure patients understand in this regard. Next slide. So as we mentioned before, complications are something that happen and uh, we try to avoid them as much as possible. And for this type of surgery, they tend to be very, very uh, small, uh, less than 5%. Um, there are uh, variables that uh, can be predictive of nipple necrosis. Um, so depending on the, the mastectomy access incision, patient age, body mass index, which or whether the obesity can be a problem for us, initial implant volume, smoking status. For a lot of these procedures, we just can't, if you're smoking, we can't do them. And it's not a moral position. It's just the fact that uh, um, the nicotine in the system and the blood system actually uh, squeezes down all the little blood vessels and causes wound healing problems. Obviously, previous breast cancer in that breast, uh, any previous radiation, and also pre-existing scars on the breast can add to uh, problems, wound healing problems as well. Next slide, please. Uh, risks immediately after prophylactic mastectomy can include bleeding or infection, uh, generally in uh, young, non-smoking, uh, otherwise healthy patients, these are quite rare fluid collection under the scar, delayed wound healing, scar tissue formation, or nipple areola loss or necrosis, which again can be rare um, in these uh, patients. Next, please. More long-term risks uh, include um, uh, loss of sensation as we've talked about. Uh, and we, as, as obvious as this may sound, uh, we have to also, state the obvious that the ability to breastfeed afterwards uh, is not possible once you've got an implant in there. Um, and also this is a change in body shape. It's a change in uh, your body image and some women can experience anxiety uh, and depression about body image. And as we mentioned before, um, Although the prophylactic mastectomy or the risk reduction is very significant, it is possible still to uh, develop a breast cancer in part of the breast as uh, however rare that is, uh, as Dr. Uh, Metcalf has mentioned. Next slide, please. Uh, I'm just gonna talk a little bit about the, the breast implants. Uh, they are a pretty common way of, of doing this uh, type of surgery uh, and reconstruction. Next slide, please. Um, most silicone implants uh, last about 10 to 15 years, uh, even longer than in tw uh, up to 20 years now. They are always upgrading the materials. Uh, we tend to use silicone more than we use saline. Uh, saline implants tend to ripple quite a bit and they, uh, there's also a leak rateage. Um, you can get caps or contraction uh, around the implants and you may have read about silicone implants these days. There's uh, implant uh, associated illnesses uh, that people have been reporting through the FDA and also um, uh, implant uh, associated ALCL, which is a type of uh, rare lymphoma that can happen with uh, textured implants, uh, which are not used anymore. And also is an extremely rare phenomena uh, and uh, to the degree that I, I have never actually seen it myself in any of my patients. Um, 
but I, I'm aware that it does happen and it certainly has happened in other, uh, to my colleagues in, uh, in the city. This is a picture of a, a, an implant. The old implants you may have read about were full of a silicone oil. Uh, the modern implants are now are like a jello. So if you cut them in half, it just sort of sits there. The, imp, the, uh, the silicone is uh, very highly cross-linked and does not spread once it's, uh, uh, if, if there's any uh, fatigue or any rupture of the, the lining. Next slide, please. And so how often should you have these implants checked? So uh, we usually ask patients to come back every so often, every couple of years, two or three years, uh, just as follow-up. Many patients know where we are and if everything seems fine, they, they can skip that, but they know if there's an issue to come back and see us. You don't need imaging on a regular basis. We would only do an ultrasound if uh, you came back and there was a problem. Even if you came back at 10 or 15 years, if the implants seem fine, we wouldn't uh, uh, be changing them over uh, at that point uh, unless, uh, unless there was a problem. Um, is it a big procedure to switch uh, to new, new implants? Uh, I know it's easy for me to say, uh, no, it's not um, because the pocket's already there. You can take the implant in and out through the same incision and it's a very short procedure and uh, there's very little um, down, uh, downsize or downtime from your point of view. Next slide, please. And just to cover nipple areola reconstruction, uh, there can be uh, nipple sharing or grafts. Uh, uh, very commonly now, if you need a nipple, uh, tattooing is very common. There are people out there that do 3D tattooing, uh, which is quite remarkable. Uh, and uh, they look uh, pretty amazing, even up close and many patients are choosing that as an option. Next slide. And uh, just moving forward, this is the second last slide, just uh, saying that uh, Women's College is uh, um, trying to, oh, we're continuing to develop our HBOC clinic, which is a hereditary breast and ovarian cancer clinic with more longitudinal follow-up uh, towards a more comprehensive care program uh, to provide a more continuous updates for patients uh, with uh, genetic uh, uh, dispositions in terms of breast cancer and other types of cancer. And this is headed up uh, by um, Bridget Lord, who's our nurse practitioner. Um, we have a lot of support from different people, including, including uh, Kate and Lodick, and of course, uh, Kelly Metcalf and myself uh, are uh, always trying to provide a more continuing service uh, for this um, uh, patient population. Next slide. And in summary, uh, so we have reviewed uh, and, and quite a an, uh, superficial overview of current trends in risk reduction mastectomy practice, but also uh, current trends in combined breast reconstruction uh, with risk reduction mastectomy and we're happy to answer any questions at this time. Thank you, Dr. Semple. So um, now's your chance to ask us questions. I did see some hands go up on the screen, but um, we can't see those hands, who they came from. So if you did put your hand up and didn't type your question into the Q&A button at the bottom, please do that. Uh, because that's where we're going to be getting our questions from. Okay, Dr. Semple, can one have a flap reconstruction from abdominal tissue if you've already had abdominal surgery? It, uh, good question. It depends on where the scar is. Um, usually uh, C-section scars, if they're uh, low down, don't really make that much difference. Uh, if it's uh, a vertical incision from the belly button downwards, sometimes that's not an issue either. But if you've had a tummy tuck or even uh, aggressive liposuction, usually that means you cannot have uh, used that, that tissue. Mm -hmm. And Dr. Semple, I think that that's a good point, that every woman is so different. So it really no. takes an assessment by a plastic surgeon like you to come up with recommendations. It's not, not all options are gonna work for all women. Exactly, no, that's very yeah. true. 
Yeah. yeah. So if you have any questions, please, um, we can get you a referral to Dr. Seppel if you're in Toronto, or we'll help you figure out where to see someone if you're having these kind of questions. There's another um, question from someone with a BRCA2 mutation. She sounds like she's had breast cancer and she's waiting to have her other breast removed preventatively, but she did have radiation and chemotherapy. And so the plastic surgeon wants to wait about one year before doing the next surgery. And she's worried that this is a long time. So Dr. Semple, do you want to comment on that? Uh, a long time for the reconstruction or a long time? For I, the I think it sounds until the next surgery is not going to be for one more year because of she's had this active treatment for her breast cancer. So the right. plastic surgeon is recommending waiting for a year. Right. So the so we commonly wait one year because the radiation is uh, an excellent way of preventing any recurrence. Um, and uh, for the first six months, uh, radiation causes quite a bit of inflammation uh, in the in the chest area where the, we would be doing the breast reconstruction. Uh, and then you have to wait for the inflammation to disappear, which is essentially one year. So that would be pretty standard from uh, many of the plastic surgeons that I know that we would wait one year um, for doing the reconstruction. And I might add to that as well, when we're thinking about these BRCA1 and BRCA2 carriers, remember that data that I showed you about how um, prophylactic oophorectomy or the removal of your ovaries and fallopian tubes helps reduce your risk of contralateral breast cancer in addition to your ovarian cancer risk. So that is a recommendation for all women with a BRCA1 or 2 mutation. So that might be something that you wanna consider within that year as well, if, if you're really worried. Um, that would be an option as well to be considering having that preventive surgery during that year that you're waiting for your next breast surgery. Um, okay, let me go through some of these questions. If you decide to have to use implants and reconstruction, can you still have a tummy tuck done at the same time? <laughs> yes, that you would can. be the best of both worlds. <laughs> yes, you can. And and to to the to that point. Um, uh, if you have implants, uh, uh, you can always switch to have using your own tissue down the road. Not that we're trying to line you up for multiple procedures, but but yes, it's possible to have uh, a tummy tuck at the same time as having reconstruction. Although if you were having a mastectomy and immediate reconstruction, you would probably, it might be, the surgery might be way too long if you have a tummy tuck added to the end of that, but um, there are often other touch-up procedures that are done uh, for the breast areas uh, after reconstruction where a tummy tuck could be done uh, at that time. Okay. Another question, Dr. Semple, could you speak to any advances in sensation preserving techniques? Yeah, that's a very good question. And there are, there's a number of plastic surgeons uh, now working on this uh, this whole idea of, of preserving uh, uh, nerves or or patterns, or actually rebuilding the nerves uh, to the to the nipple, uh, these are very preliminary, um, and um, the the nerves that uh, the breast surgeon the, the breast surgeon can't actually see the nerves. The nerves are like fine hairs and embedded in the tissue, and to do their the proper job of uh, taking away as much of the breast tissue itself, it, it involves taking away a lot of the nerves and most of the nerves. So um, I think that there's still a lot of work. There's even work about doing allograft or using other patients' nerves uh, that have been donated, but there, the cost of that is, as you would imagine, hugely expensive and it's very, um, developmental and very uh, experimental at this point. But there are, we're very conscious of that whole concept of trying to preserve uh, nipple sensation and skin sensation. And there's a lot of people working on it. Okay, great. What, I mean, many of these women are younger women um, who are considering having bilateral prophylactic mastectomy if we're thinking about preventing those breast cancers. So, and many of these women may be very active, have 
in sports or have young children yeah. at home. Yeah. So when thinking about reconstruction, are there long-term limitations, impacts after recovery period for those women who are very active? Is that uh, something to consider in your decision-making? No, I, I, I think we have, I have patients that are, uh, you know, long, uh, long distance runners, patient, patients, uh, I've, one of my patients has run the Boston Marathon many times. And uh, uh, so, and I, uh, uh, and, and there's, you know, we, in the pr different positions that we put uh, the implant now, so that any of the pre-pectoral reconstructions, you can do, uh, you can do yoga, you can do, um, and even, even uh, uh, we had a patient that had uh, uh, an, an implant underneath the muscle on the left side, and uh, she actually played at Roland Garros in the, yeah. uh, the, the French, French Open tennis tournament, and she claimed her backhand was better after she yeah. had her reconstruction. <laughs> I, don't know if that's, I, I don't know if she had to declare that as a, or disclose <laughs> it as an advantage, but, uh, uh, but she, uh, anyway, I think my point is uh, our, our goal is to get you back to your activities uh, that you want to do uh, for the rest of your life without uh, thinking twice about it. So. Mm -hmm. Okay. There's so many questions and I'm not sure we're going to get through all of them. So I'm trying to lump them together. Um, breast cancer can start in the nipple tissue for those who keep their nipple. It's rare, but it could happen because we do keep a little bit of tissue underneath the nipple to basically keep the nipple in, alive. Is that right, right Dr. Semple? Yes. So if a woman has a nipple reconstructed, Yes. Um, is that really, is that the same kind of tissue? Is there a risk of cancer developing in that reconstructed nipple? Uh, no, um, because it's, uh, it has to be what we call native tissue from there. It has to be, it has to have breast ductal tissue within it. And uh, um, the, uh, when we looked at all the MRIs, we did a study where we looked at the MRIs and how much the nipple actually represents in terms of uh, a percentage of the total ductal tissue, and it's generally less than one percent. So, um, but it yes, it can happen. But commonly, a lot of the surgeons will biopsy the back of the nipple um, just to uh, and send that off separately. Mm -hmm. uh, to make sure that there's no nothing starting there, and, and it also thins that area out. So, yeah. but uh, I guess the answer is no for for that. Okay, yeah. good to know. And I do also want to reiterate about the nipple sparing mastectomy. Considering some of the numbers I showed today, I think again it's really important to, if you're considering this kind of surgery, to be thinking about a high volume center where these types of surgeries and where we're doing some of these procedures like what Dr. De Semple just described where we're biopsying uh, underneath the nipple and looking at that just to make sure that there's nothing there. Right. Um, okay, I'm gonna I'll ask one last question um, oh, from a woman with a BRCA1 mutation who is 27 years old and she's waiting until 30 to have uh, her risk-reducing mastectomy and thinking about the risk increase. And it, it is a very small risk of developing breast cancer before the age of 30 with either BRCA1 or BRCA2. The risk is not zero, but the risk is also not zero for a woman without a BRCA1 or 2 mutation developing breast cancer. Again, it's very, very small. So we have to make these decisions um, and again, we have people to talk to you here at Women's College if you're thinking about this and helping you make the right decision for you, either going back to the genetic counselor. We have an excellent social worker in our HBOT clinic that Dr. Semple talked about. Uh, she can help you with some of this decision-making. Um, it's not an easy decision to make and there is no right answer for any woman, including the age at which you decide to do this if you do decide. So I, all I can say is the risk is low before the age of 30, but it's not zero. So that's something that you have to be comfortable. But again, this surgery has to fit in with your life as well. Uh, perhaps I, I, we often see patients uh, who have no intention of, of having 
uh, reconstruction right away, but just want to find out what's, you know, have, have somebody assess them in terms of their own particular case, in terms of what type of options they would have personally. And mm -hmm. from our point of view, we act more as an educational resource than, uh, so we want to make sure that you're aware of all your potential options and how suitable you are for each of those options. And commonly, patients sit on that for a couple of years and then they might come back and see us again with a more firm idea of how they want to go forward. So, so we're always happy to, to talk to people without any sort of proprietary or, or yeah. hard sell on having surgery just because you've seen us. We, again, we're acting more as a, a service and an educational resource. That's a great point, Dr. Semple. So for anybody who wants to have a conversation, please let us know and we can help uh, get some of those referrals for you. So we are just past one o'clock and I'm sorry, I didn't get to all of the questions, but if you do have specific questions, um, you can email me or um, if you wanted to meet with Dr. Semple, we can figure out a way to get you a referral to see Dr. Semple as well. I just want to remind you that you will receive um, uh, an evaluation form. It's important for you for, for you to evaluate, but also there's a section on topics that you would like to see covered in the future. So Dr. Katsopoulos and I are now planning for the 2023 seminar series. And please let us know what topics you would like to see us cover in the next year, because we are planning for that. So um, right now we don't have anything set for January, but as soon as we figure out our schedule for the new year, you will be the first to know. And um, please share it with your relatives, your friends who you think might benefit from this. They're, these record these sessions are also recorded. So if you have anybody who wants to go back and look at them, you can find them on our website. So thank you to everyone for joining us. This is the last seminar of 2022. It's they've been a great success. We've appreciated you uh, your you attending and your interest, and we'd like to keep them going. So please send us your suggestions. And I hope everyone has a nice holiday season, and we will see you again in January. Thank you. Bye bye. Right. Thanks, Dr. Semple. Thanks, Kelly. Okay. Bye bye. Bye bye. bye, -bye.